Amen. Yeah, what a great day. Super fun. I love being at church. You ever just like get in that place, you're like, I just need to go to church. Keith, one of our pastors, he always says this, if you're scared, go to church. You guys are a stiff crowd this morning. All right, everybody take a deep breath. Let it out. All right, we good? Amen. Yeah, it's the Lord, isn't it? He's just settled upon you, that's what it is. Um, no, I'm really, really thankful to get to share with you this morning. If you're a first-time guest, we want to tell you welcome. Thanks for coming to Rooney Life Church. Church family, can we welcome any first-time guests that might be in the room? Thank you so much for coming. Pray that um, you come back and that you're blessed. How many of you were here last week? You came back. Fantastic. <laughs> we had an adventure last week uh, in this service, and, uh, you know, I... I there's a lot of things that could be said, but there's one thing that should be said, and that the peace of God never left the room. And I am so encouraged in that. Um, we have met with the individual that was having um, the, uh, the demonic encounter in our service, which if you weren't here last week, you're like, well, hold on a second. What did I just walk into? If you're a first time guest, you're like, what in the world just happened? Um, it is in scripture, Jesus encountered it often, and we encountered it last week, and she's doing fantastic. Um, she is, um, yeah, absolutely, super, super cool. Um, made some incredible progress with her Sunday, but then she came in the office on Tuesday. Um, we plowed through some other stuff, and she is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and looks incredible, sounds incredible, and uh, is making some strides to change, which is fantastic. And so super cool and just, just really, really honored that the Lord actually makes the scriptures come alive. <laughs> Last week when we were getting ready for the service, um, I, before actually even the first service, I was walking the sanctuary during run through uh, and I was praying and just asking the Lord, like, what do you want to do today? And He's like, uh, I really felt strongly, I was praying on this side of the room and I really felt that I heard the Lord say, today is going to be a day where people are going to fall in love with the wonder and the awe of who I am. And fast forward a little bit, a couple hours later, we had what we had in worship. Uh, we never got out of worship. It was just this really, really peaceful, heavy, um, incredible moment with the Lord. And I just believe that God is doing some incredible things in our church. We're seeing miracles in the first service. Like I said, there were miracles that happened in worship. There were five people that gave their life to Jesus during ministry time in worship on the first service, which is the most incredible miracle of all is salvation. Um, yeah, God is moving. And, and so I'm, I'm honestly really thankful to be a part of a church like this that just as willing to go. And uh, I believe that God has taken us to some amazing places. So God is working. Uh, if you have a Bible, let's go ahead and open that. That'd be a really good thing to do. Uh, 2 Kings chapter four is where I'm going to be. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on the screen. I'm gonna read out the New Living Translation this morning. Um, it says, one day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband, whom served you, is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now, a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha said. Tell me what you have in the house. Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and your neighbors. Then go into the house with your sons and shut your door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon, every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live off of what is left over. Pretty uh, in, in, amazing group of scriptures here. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna dive into more conversation about this. But God, I thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're doing. Uh, we just, we turn control over to you. I pray that you would take over our mind, our will, and our emotions in these moments, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And I pray that we would see things in Scripture that, that bring revelation and truth to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you. 
to uh, teach us the word as we open it. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you find yourself in awkward situations? You ever find yourself in just awkward situations? Maybe it's because you're awkward. I'm not calling you awkward, but maybe that's, maybe. Uh, I've been in some awkward situations. I was thinking about some awkward situations as I was writing this, and there was that one time that I went to get a pedicure with my wife, and for some reason, my shirt came off in a nail salon. That's not supposed to happen. That was awkward. Uh, that, that, that's not good. Uh, that, was, that was really awkward. Then there was that other time when I ran into or rear-ended a guy uh, in his truck at Rose's twice. Same guy. That was awkward. <laughs> it was really awkward to do it the first time. It was really awkward to do it the second time. Hit him the first time. He rolled forward. I let off the clutch like in utter disappointment. Hit him again just for good measure. <laughs> awkward. Sometimes it happens. There was that one time when I had just gotten saved, didn't know much about being around Christian people, but I decided, you know what? We're going to play football. So I'm going to wear Snap Adidas wind pants to play flag football. Everything was fine until there was a sudden breeze. I was streaking down the sideline and I had flags on, but I had no pants on. And that was, uh, that was awkward. Awkward happens. Uh, maybe you can all relate to this one. You're at dinner at a really nice restaurant and then they bring the check out, but no one's decided who's paying yet. Everyone acts like they want to reach for it, but they, they reach for it with like Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. It's like this awkward moment. And you're like, I, I, I got it. You, you, you got it? Me? You? You? Him? Me? You got it? And then someone like reaches for it and you like make this like attempt. And you're like, you don't have to do that. Really, you don't have. Okay, I'm going to let you do that awkward moment. It's, it's never awkward when it's your parents, though. You know, if it's your parents, you're like, oh, yeah, you got it. You can pay. It's totally fine. Awkward happens oftentimes, and one thing that I have learned is that sometimes people are just awkward with God. You ever been awkward with the Lord? You ever found yourself in one of those places where you're just awkward with God? Uh, not sure if it's okay to pray what you want to pray. Awkward in ways of like, I don't know if I can actually ask God for this. I remember talking to a friend once and he was just unpacking these things that were going on in their life and just some troubles and some hardships. And I was like, man, this is, this is pretty heavy. Have you asked God to help you with this? And he's like, no, not at all. I'm like, you haven't taken this to God in prayer? And he's like, no, he's got so many other things to deal with that I, I shouldn't bring my little thing because I don't want to like, I know he's dealing with bigger things and I don't want to mess up the bigger things so that he can work on my, my little thing. And it's interesting how sometimes we ask God for things um, that are moderate. And we approach God like he is a moderate God and God is not a moderate God. God is not a, a just enough kind of God. He's not, not just gonna get you by kind of God. He is a lavish God, amen? He is a God that does things over the top. I mean, he paves the streets in gold. Like, that's, that's pretty over top. Like, there's a lot of other materials. He's like, no, no, no. This is the one that fits me the best. I want gold. And I'm like, you know what? I like you. The truth is this. Because there is no limit to God's supply, there are no limits to what God can and will do in your life. Because there is no limit to God's supply, there is no limit to what he can or will do in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. We've been following, uh, as, I, as I've taught the last few times that I've taught, we've been following the ministry of Elisha. Elisha was a prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, Elisha, we learned, is, his ministry literally is just this massive prophetic foreshadowing of the ministry of Jesus that was to come once Jesus came onto the earth. And in the story that we read just a little bit ago that we opened with, there's obviously like a, a serious, desperate situation. This, this is like this grim, dark moment where obviously this is a widowed woman who just lost her husband. And now because of debt, creditors are th threatening to take her two sons away from her and sell them as slaves. So you could say that this is a really, really bad moment, a poor, uh, a poor person in a poor situation. And, and when you're broke and when you're poor, I don't know if you've ever been there, it doesn't take a, it doesn't take a lot to get you out of a bind. And God literally steps in through this prophet to actually shift things for this woman. 
And God in this moment, he's about to paint a picture of who he really wants to be, not only for her, but who he wants to be for us too. So in, in that scripture that we read in 2 Kings chapter four, in verse three it said this, and Elisha said to her, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and from your neighbors, as many as you can. Then go into your house with your sons, shut the door behind you, pour olive oil from your flask into the jars. Now this sounds crazy. Setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing their jars as she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. I think it's crazy that he says, take the flask that you have in the middle of your having nothing, in the middle of not having anything, in the middle of being worried about your, your sons being sold into slavery, the only thing that you have of any value is the tiny bit of oil that is in your flask. I want you to take that and I want you to begin to pour it out. There are times when you're feeling broken and there's times when you're feeling poor and there's times when you feel dejected that the Lord says, I actually need you to put faith into what I've already supplied for you so that I can multiply it. Oftentimes in these moments, we're like, Lord, I have nothing good to offer at all. You ever been there? There's nothing good in my brain. There's nothing good in my body. I'm not doing anything. Everything that I touch, it doesn't turn to gold. It turns into something else. It smells bad. Um, he's like, no, no, no. I need you to take what you have, and I need you to allow my grace or my anointing, my power to be placed on the thing that you have, and then let me multiply it. But it came out of her obeying I think that's an interesting word that we've gotten really, really far away from in the church world. We like all of the other words except for obey, which is why our kids act the way that they do sometimes, because we need to get back to the word obey. Amen. I will amen myself on that one. In this moment, he's like, okay, I need you to get all these things, and this is where a test happens. Because the question that I would ask is, how many containers is too many? He says, go to your friends, go to your neighbors, get as many containers as you possibly can, but how many containers is too many? How many containers is too many? Will my flask not stop running as long as I have a container to pour it into? I would imagine these are some of the things that are circulating in her brain, and, and we have a luxury that this woman didn't have in the scripture. We actually can read scriptures that tell us about the goodness of God and what he might do. If you look at Philippians chapter four, verse 19, it says this, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. She didn't have the luxury to saying, oh, wait, hold on a second. What did you promise me over here? Absolutely, I'll pour the rest of my oil out because I know that there's a promise. She didn't have that. He, he says that I will meet the need according to my riches and glory, not according to the need. According to his riches. God's desire to bless you always goes beyond your need. His desire to do more for you, his desire to go above and beyond for you, it always is greater than your need for him to actually help you. I think one of the things that should be asked is this. If you really believe that God would fill every single container that you brought to him, when would you stop bringing containers? Would you stop bringing containers to God if you knew that he was gonna fill every single one of them? Would you stop bringing them once you had enough to pay off your debt? That's plenty, God. You can deal with somebody else's issue. Would you stop bringing containers when you were able to actually pay off your house? Would you stop bringing containers that he promised to fill uh, once you had enough money to retire? Or would you keep bringing containers because he told you, keep bringing containers and I'll keep filling them? Two questions that I, I think this begs for us to ask. Do you really believe that God has more than enough? Oftentimes my actions don't say that I believe that. You ever uh, got yourself, you ever been in this spot where, uh, it's funny, elementary type maybe thing, praying for a parking spot. You ever prayed for a parking spot? You ever felt guilty about praying for a parking spot? 
That's good. I've been guilty. I'm like, well, I'm sitting here praying for a parking spot, and I know there's a worse condition that someone's dealing with than me not being able to get close at H-E-B. And so I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry for praying for a parking spot. That is the wrong thing to do. Because my praying for a parking spot doesn't diminish as a power to heal somebody else's cancer across the world. But if I think that God is limited in what he can do, I will approach him like he is a limited God, knowing that he actually can't fulfill everything that he said he could. There is no limit to God. Do I really believe that God has enough? The second thing to ask is this, <laughs> do I really believe that he wants me to have more than enough? Yes. And that one can become challenging sometimes. Is it okay for me to be rich? Yes. yes. Like all stepping off in it. <laughs> now if, if my heart is right, he can trust me because he knows that if he can put it in my hands, I'm gonna get it out of my hands. Yes. Which is like getting another container. If, he, if, I, if I will step into trusting the Lord with my finances, bringing, returning the tithe, is what that says in scripture, returning the tithe. And then if I go beyond and I start executing or uh, applying um, giving, and me actually giving something that was mine, that was blessed because of him, he knows that if I will do that over and over, I'm basically creating a container where I'm saying, Lord, if you'll put something in here, I'll give it out. When we planted this, not when we planted this church, when we were thinking about building this church, we needed a building. We were in uh, the theater, we were leasing the theater, we leased a Midland Community Theater for seven years, for those that are new. Set up, tear down every single Sunday, upstairs, downstairs, had a full team, three trailers full of stuff. Uh, we pulled it off and it was incredible. But we were needing a building, we wanted a building. And one of the things that Braden, our senior pastor, if you've been around Braden for very long, you'll know that he is a person who has wild faith he will do some wild, crazy things that don't make sense, which is what faith is. And so he came to the church one day. We're, we're, we're needing a building. We're leasing a space. And he says, I, we're fixing to start a building campaign, but I really feel like this is what the Lord is saying. I feel like he said that he can do more with a seed than he can with a dollar. Amen. So we took up one offering on one Sunday of like $125,000, and we gave it to a church in California that was fixing to start building a building. And we needed a building. But when we decided to actually start raising money for this building, God gave 10 times the amount of the seed that we sowed in one Sunday. Because when you bring a container and your heart says, if you'll fill my container, I will give it away. He'll, const he'll constantly keep filling up the container. He'll constantly keep pouring oil into the container. Do I really believe that God wants me to have more than enough? Yeah, I do. John chapter 10, verse 10, in the Amplified Version, Jesus said this. He said, I came that they may have life and enjoy life and have an abundance to the full till it overflows. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to full till life overflows, till it overflows. That's why he actually came. The point is this, is that because of Jesus, God will fill every area of our lives as long as we rest and stop trying to fill them up ourselves. The oil will stop flowing when I start trying to fill it up myself. When I move out of my place, we've been talking about the law and we've been talk, talking about grace. We've been talking about how the law, under the law, it's all about what you do. It's about your works. Your works justify you. But under the covenant of grace, Jesus and all that he did on the cross and our belief in that, it justifies us. We are righteous. We are in right standing with God because of what Jesus did in our belief that he actually finished everything on the cross for us, right? And so when I... When I choose to rest in that, I'm actually making myself more available for God to fill all of the areas of my life that I need him to fill. When I choose to rest, 
The oil continues to flow because his blessing and his anointing and his grace is on it for it to flow. But the moment that I step out of that and I say, I'm going to do this myself, watch out. All of a sudden, there's the little bit that you had in the flask is actually only what you had. And you poured it all out and now there's nothing left. And you're saying, I actually need God's grace on my life to do the things that are set before me. Is there room in your marriage for God? Is there room in the way that you parent your kids for God? Is there room in your job? Is there room in your finances? And if not, what are they actually full of? Are they full of your good works or are they full of his good works? Are they full of what you can do and that's why you have what you have? Or are they from a position of you believing that without God you could do nothing, are nothing, think nothing? The grace of God is so available. Look at John chapter four, verses seven through 11, it says this. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where will you get that living water? I think it's interesting, the woman, Jesus is offering this woman fulfillment, and she went straight to something natural. She's like, you don't even have a bucket. How are you gonna draw water? He's like, I'm trying to offer you living water, something that is going to fulfill you. I think sometimes we fall into the place of putting more weight on natural than spiritual. But he keeps going. Are you greater? She says, are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him, everyone who drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I might not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water any longer. What was Jesus doing here? He's saying, I am what you're looking for. I am the, I am the answer to your problems. I'm the answer to your money problem. I'm the answer to your parenting problem. I'm the answer to your job problems. I am the problem. And not only am I the answer to your problems, I am the only answer that never changes. I am the only answer that lasts. Jesus offers fulfillment. And then he says, I'm not just offering you momentary fulfillment. I'm asking you long lasting, life giving till it overflows fulfillment. That is who Jesus is and that is what he is offering us every moment of every single day. Will you actually just collect enough uh, jars? Will you actually just connect, collect enough that you would pour your oil so that the blessing that flows from your life continues to last until it overflows and then you give it away? until it overflows, and then you give it away. And Jesus is the answer that lasts. I wanna close with this very last thought. The prophet Elijah in this situation with this, this woman, he gives her some very clear instructions and she's in debt. He says, just to read it one more time. So she did as, he was, as she was told. Her son kept bringing jars to her and he filled them one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped running. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. The woman was in debt because her husband didn't leave her in a financial position that was stable. He died. Now she incurred his debt, their debt. They're in this position because of bad decision making. Yet Jesus is big enough to get you out of the mess, even the ones that you create. 
more of the, more of the law versus grace thing conversation. Oftentimes we think because I created the mess, I have to work hard to get myself out of the mess before I can even go to Jesus to actually ask for repentance or to actually ask for forgiveness. And Jesus in this story, this is a prophetic foreshadowing of the life that Jesus was going to live in the ministry of Jesus. And he says, I realize that you are in debt. I realize that you've screwed up your marriage or you, maybe you're on your third one. I realize that you haven't done well with your finances and your health is out of order. I realize all of these things, but if you will just offer me what is in your hand, I will actually make sure that you have enough for yourself and then you can sell and pay off your debt. I am the payment for all of your debt. Now let me give you life until it over flows. This is who Jesus is. This is what he offered us. Will you actually give me access to your life so that I can actually put you in position for you to experience life and life everlasting until it overflows? I love this. Grace can get you out of a hole with plenty left over for you to move forward on. That's who Jesus is. If you find yourself in a hole, if you find yourself in a position where you've wasted relationships or where you've wasted time or you feel like I've wasted so much time with my kids, I'll never get it back. And so you just continue to make the same old mistakes or you're actually trying to force something. Give it to Jesus, let him do his thing to it and he will put you in a position where you have more until it overflows. It's who he is and he's good at his job, amen. Thank you so much for watching today. If you need prayer or would like more information, please reach out to us on our website at renewlifechurch.com or find us on social media. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to join us in person at one of our two campuses in Midland or Lubbock, Texas. Have a great week and we hope to see you soon.